Det er en test. Ja tak. Test. Ja tak. Ja, det her det er en test. Ja, 1, 2, 3. Georgie, have you uh, have you? I doesn't have the. Yeah, one, two, three. Yeah, one, two, three. It doesn't seem that the audio is coming in. Um, but uh, you will. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Tom. Yeah, Tom. Are you using this camera? It should be this one. Should In two, three, yeah, yeah. Why is it so low? Yeah. In two, three, yeah, Tom. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Okay, yeah, talk. Yeah, sorry. Okay, yeah, talk. Three feet. It's fine now. Ja, det er en test. 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 Ja, tak. Ja, det er godt. Ja, det er sådan. Ja. Okay, ja tak. Ja, det er fint. Ja tak. Ja. Sådan.
Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Ja, okay. Det virker. Skal vi? Ja, så... Ja, så er det. Ja, så er det. Ja, tak. Ja, det er godt. Jeg tror, det er god der.
はいはい OK Welcome to this uh, inaugural lecture by our professor Thomas Law. My name is uh, Preben Jørgensen and I'm the head of the Department of Electrical Engineering here at Technical University of Denmark. I'm glad so many can attend this important event. Positive with that many from around the globe and including different time zones. You have access to this uh, lecture both using Zoom and using YouTube. Yes, we use uh, two different types of technologies for this important event. I hope it works well. The program for this event is as follows. After my introduction, our professor Thomas Lau will give a lecture and it will take about 40 minutes. Hereafter, we will have time for questions our professor Jakob Östergaard will organize that part. Therefore, please use our platforms either one, Zoom and the chat function, or two, our or the YouTube channel where it should be possible as well to submit uh, questions. You are welcome to write these questions during the lecture. After the lecture, uh, and session with questions, we will have a big applause, virtually, naturally. Uh, this is the formal part. Uh, originally, we had planned to have a reception after this uh, formal part. Unfortunately, that is not possible due to the challenges with COVID-19. I know some of you have planned to say something at the physical reception. Therefore, I will give the floor to those of you after the formal part. We will do that virtually, of course, and I hope that you will participate in that session as well. I expect the formal part to take approximately one hour, and then we will have approximately 50 minutes or something like that for the speeches after the formal part. Therefore, it is my pleasure to introduce our professor, Thomas Long. And I would like to emphasize that uh, Thomas Lau's path to DTU goes from Croatia to uh, Aalborg University and further on here to Technical University of Denmark. And I know as well that Thomas Lau have had several international stays. I am also aware about that Thomas Lau will give some further details about the road here to DTU. The title of the inaugural lecture is AI-inspired control, design, diagnostics in converter-based power systems. Thomas Lau, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Preben, uh, for introduction, and uh, welcome to all uh, <coughs> the audience that is joining through, through uh, YouTube and Zoom. And um, the title of inaugural lecture, as Preben mentioned, is AI-inspired control design and diagnostics in converter-based power systems. And thinking maybe that uh, some of the audience is not so familiar, familiar with uh, technical terms, I have prepared a little slide just to explain what this title means. So uh, many of you know that uh, uh, in uh, ongoing times uh, we are uh, experiencing green transitions where more and more renewables like photovoltaic and wind are being connected to our electrical power systems and at the same time uh, there is a strong trend uh, for uh, transportation electrification. Uh, all these units are connected to our electrical power system through power electronic converters. 
So this is, this is why system is getting more and more power electronics in, and uh, this is why I call it converter-based power system. Then we have these three terms, control, design, and diagnostics, and uh, basically power converters need to be con uh, controlled in a regulated way in order to provide the fu function that we need from them. If you take an analogy of your phone charger, it also needs to be uh, uh, controlled in a certain way to provide regulated power to your phone's battery, otherwise the battery would get destroyed. So, so it's very similar way in our power systems. We need to provide regulated power from those renewables and also to charge our vehicles. Uh, relating to design, it's uh, about decisions how those uh, power electronic converters are built, where they are uh, placed in the system, and how many of them, and so on. So in order th that uh, they best fit the purpose uh, which they are intended for. And then we have the third term, which is uh, diagnostics. And this is related to the uh, idea that uh, we want to be able to detect if something is wrong, either with the power converters or in the system. This can be a component fault, or this can be some other type of anomaly, like cyber attack, and so on. So this is, uh, again, we can take an analogy. When you are driving your car, there is some app that is telling you that you are over speeding, or there is some app in your phone that is uh, detecting your health issues. So these are uh, uh, pretty similar principles, just applied to converter-based power systems. Uh, and then we have this last term, AI, which stands for artificial intelligence. Uh, this means that uh, uh, instead of using conventional way to do control, design, and diagnostics, uh, I try to apply techniques inspired by how human brain uh, works and uh, solve some challenges in control, design, and diagnostic in more efficient and effective way using those types of techniques. But I will come back to more detail uh, later. So once I introduced and explained a little bit why the title is as, as it is, uh, this is the agenda of the lecture. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about my career path, which Preben shortly touched upon, how I end up in DTU. Uh, then I will talk a little bit about uh, uh, my current research, and uh, this one related with the AI and so on. And uh, uh, then I will uh, introduce uh, new an initiatives that I have started here as a new professor at the DTU. I have been here for uh, uh, almost uh, five months now, and uh, many new activities uh, have been started. So I will uh, like to use the opportunity to introduce uh, some of them. And lastly, and maybe most importantly, I will use uh, some time to acknowledge all the people that, that have uh, uh, shaped my career and shaped me as a person, and I, I'm really thankful to them, so, so I, I will uh, acknowledge uh, some of them. So considering my career path, uh, here is written in a slide uh, where I have been and what I have been doing. Maybe it's a lot of information and a little bit chaotic. So, so I have prepared this uh, another slide where I have shown uh, where I have been moving. So, so I have started as a PhD student in, uh, in Zagreb, uh, Croatia in 2009. And uh, already in s second year of my PhD, I started to consider to make a study abroad uh, PhD. And I have got in touch with uh, Professor uh, Joseph Guerrero from Barcelona, and my idea was to visit him in Barcelona. Uh, initially. However, in the meantime, he got a position at uh, Olborg University, so by chance uh, I decided to follow him, and I ended up in 2012 as a guest PhD at uh, Olborg University. My initial idea was to stay there only a couple of months and return back to Croatia to, to become a tenured assistant professor at the University of Zagreb. But, uh, but uh, somehow, uh, I started to like uh, the, the atmosphere there, and we got some projects and so on, so I accepted a uh, postdoc uh, option and stayed there one more year. Then I got another option, stayed a couple of more years, and so on. And then, uh, and then in 2016, I have become associate professor uh, at Olborg University. Uh, at, uh, also in that year, I made a guest, uh, a guest stay uh, in Chile, in the University of Talca where I met uh, some very nice uh, friends and colleagues uh, with whom I operate up to this day and cooperate. And uh, also in 2018, I have made another uh, guest professor stay at the uh, University of Nottingham. 
And uh, uh, lastly, in 2019, I have noticed a uh, position opening at DTU, and for curiosity, I applied for it, and I got a job offer. So from 2020, I'm uh, located at DTU in Copenhagen. And I would also like to note that next year, uh, I, will go, I will go for another guest professor stay in Aachen, Germany, uh, which is financed by uh, von Humboldt uh, uh, Fellowship. So now I would like to talk a little bit about the projects that, uh, and things that I have been working on during all these years, uh, moving from Croatia to Denmark and so on. So this was my first project that I was involved in, in, in uh, Croatia. It was, it was uh, um, ordered by one of the largest telecom operators in Croatia, and the idea was to build uh, uh, a renewable energy-based uh, a remote telecom station. And uh, you can see a picture of this station. I was part of a team who built this station, and to best of my knowledge, this, uh, this facility is still operating very well today. And uh, actually, uh, from technological standpoint, it, it was uh, fairly simple. So we just had a big battery connected to a DC bus, and then a number of off-the-shelf uh, components uh, put together so, so that uh, it, can, it can supply uh, 0 to 24 uh, electrical power to telecom loads. Uh, uh, the, the, because of this technological simplicity, uh, uh, basically control uh, and, and uh, was not such a big issue, but the issue was the proper sizing of the components. So, so we needed to make sure that uh, we, uh, we put enough battery and enough solar and wind in order uh, that uh, we never lose uh, uh, the power. And this was actually a, a fairly uh, uh, interesting challenge. And uh, uh, here I produced uh, my first scientific article that tried to propose a solution to this challenge. And uh, we found some interesting uh, conclusions is that, uh, for example, if we buy cheaper battery, it will cost us less at the beginning, but this battery will degrade faster. So at the end of the day, after a couple of years, it will cost us more because we will need to replace it more frequently. So it was an interesting conclusion that, that uh, basically it's, uh, it's better to buy more expensive battery because it will degrade uh, uh, less. Then uh, my first project uh, at Olborg University was funded by uh, Aeronet uh, Smart Grid and it was related with uh, fast electrical vehicle charging uh, infrastructure and here we used a little bit different architecture so control was uh, a little bit more challenge here and in particular we tried to we tried to connect uh, energy storage to electrical vehicle charging station so that when electrical vehicle starts its charging process it doesn't disturb uh, the grid too much so that uh, certain support is provided by the energy storage. And the uh, uh, idea was to achieve this functionality without using any communication, which would uh, introduce a single point of failure and so on. So, so I proposed a technique where, where uh, the grid connected uh, power converter and uh, storage connected power converter are coordinated in decentralized way. So in particular, we used uh, DC link uh, voltage as a communication medium. So for example, when storage is a little bit less charged, we communicate a little bit lower DC link voltage. And uh, by building small experimental uh, test uh, platform at Olborg University at that time, I have shown that actually we can transform the initial peak of charging into a ramp that, uh, that basically uh, burdens the grid much less. Uh, and uh, also I have proposed some other uh, techniques for this kind of decentralized coordination. In particular, uh, there, uh, there was a power line uh, signaling concept where uh, on top of uh, changing the DC link voltage in the power converter, we also superimpose uh, AC voltage and uh, in this way achieve additional functionalities. So, so these, were, these were the works uh, from that time. Uh, then uh, I also looked at uh, uh, possible uh, uh, like drawbacks and advantages of other control techniques that potentially include uh, communication, because if we have communication, uh, we can provide more intelligence to the system and, and it, it can be more functional. Uh, so, so I made uh, some uh, review article at that time comparing uh, 
uh, advantages and disadvantages of uh, different techniques, but uh, already at that time it became apparent that uh, even though communication can bring certain advantages in flexibility how we control the system, it also brings some challenges and in particular uh, cyber security was seen as a challenge. Uh, at that time uh, there were uh, public, publicly uh, reported cyber attacks in power systems in Ukraine and it was a big, uh, big news. So together with, uh, with a student uh, uh, from Technological uh, University of Delhi, Subham Sahu, I started cooperating uh, together at uh, looking at those uh, cyber security issues, particularly in smaller scale uh, power electronic systems, which we sometimes call uh, microgrids. Uh, and this is actually um, uh, yeah, we publish many papers together, but this is one that I would like to point out because it reviews uh, different challenges and ways how we can, uh, how we can uh, solve them. Uh, another challenge was uh, stability uh, in, in, in power electronic based system and stability challenges are a little bit different depending on architecture uh, that we use. But I will maybe discuss that uh, a little bit later uh, if we have time. Then uh, uh, coming back to that project uh, which we had with Flywheel Energy Storage for electrical vehicle charging station, um, it became interesting uh, for some big companies in Denmark, uh, which uh, for example Maersk Drilling, we had a big project with Innovation Fund uh, to, to investigate uh, what kind of benefits could we get by installing uh, Flywheel Energy Storage in uh, drilling vessels. And, and it, was, it turned out that up to 20% of fuel can be saved uh, if, uh, with, with, with storage and, uh, and basically uh, this 20% saving was, was achieved with, with very simple and uh, kind of heuristic control of, of energy storage based on, uh, uh, on so-called uh, high pass filter uh, but, but it, it, it soon turned out that uh, actually sizing of storage, control of storage and the mission profile in which the storage should, op should operate uh, these uh, things are all connected with each other and actually uh, my hypothesis is that uh, even four to five percent more uh, energy can be saved if we take all these things together into account. And as I will discuss later, I think artificial intelligence techniques uh, can help us a lot in, in solving those uh, challenges. Then, uh, as mentioned, in 2016, I, I made uh, a guest uh, postdoc stay in uh, uh, Chile with my good friends uh, 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 Marco Rivera and Professor Jose Rodriguez. And this is the first time I got introduced uh, to a uh, kind of new topic to me, which was uh, model predictive control of power electronic converters. And, and, and this was at that time radically different uh, way of controlling power converters compared to uh, what I have known from before. And the uh, simple principle is that uh, we have a power converter which has a number of switching configurations and instead of uh, uh, designing the control with, with linear control theory which calculates the duty cycle and then the modulator uh, decides uh, the switching configuration, uh, here we the, the, uh, the controller directly uh, decides about the switching configuration based on the co cost function that user, uh, that user can uh, design. And it was very appealing to me, so when I came back uh, to Olborg, I started to play with, with simulations and uh, even though I was uh, discouraged by people who, who were telling me that uh, this is very well known technique, there is no value in doing research in that. Uh, but, but my good friends uh, have published a review article at that time and they have stated a number of research challenges that are yet to be solved uh, with these techniques. And I got interested in this and in the next couple of years I was uh, working hard with uh, alone and with my students and collaborators on solving uh, some of those uh, research challenges. So I have proposed uh, techniques for innovative cost function design, for uh, automated selection of weighting factors, also for performance validation of those techniques, something that was uh, not available uh, at that time. So, so besides of that, I have also been working on automated filter design, um, uh, reduction of computational burden using AI, uh, using MPC for coordinated control of multiple converters and so on. So all in all, I, I believe that uh, this is one of my most productive research areas and uh, uh, I still cooperate uh, a lot with, with colleagues around the world 
for, for further developing uh, this, uh, this topic. Then, um, uh, after joining a uh, group of uh, Professor Fle Frede Bloberg uh, uh, at Olborg, uh, I have also worked on, on uh, reliability of power electronic systems and on uh, grid-friendly friendly control of uh, power converters. And uh, we have done some uh, interesting works uh, together, but I have also uh, recognized some research challenges uh, in this field yet to be addressed. Uh, for example, um, how to instill uh, real-time intelligence in, in those power converters. So, so one thing is to, to give them fixed uh, kind of grid-friendly functionality. But I'm also interested how, how to do it in real time. So how can th those converters in real time estimate uh, their own conditions and the grid conditions and use those information to perform in a better and more effective uh, way. Uh, also considering reliability, um, uh, we have been uh, one of the first who have uh, uh, proposed the usage of artificial intelligence for uh, automated design uh, for reliability of uh, power uh, electronic systems. Uh, then uh, I also uh, got funding from uh, uh, U.S. Navy uh, when, when I was in Olborg. Uh, this is uh, Office of Naval Research Global. It's, it is an organization that funds uh, fundamental research around the world, and uh, the office uh, responsible for Denmark is located in London. And uh, we, we got a project where, where it was interesting to, to look at uh, uh, point of load converters. So, so there are lots of uh, high power loads on, uh, on military ships like uh, uh, high, high uh, power uh, sonars and radars and so on. So, so those, uh, those loads uh, significantly disturb the op operation of the ship if not accounted for. So, so what I have uh, proposed is a couple of techniques how those uh, negative effects of those high power loads can be mitigated. And uh, here is just uh, one publication that deals with it. Uh, similar problems are also experienced in uh, more electric aircrafts. And uh, I have been looking at uh, that problem during my uh, guest professor stay at uh, Nottingham University. And uh, uh, this university uh, has uh, historically been very well funded by the aviation industry. So I had a chance to work on uh, on projects uh, like Clean Sky and collaborate with, with researchers. And uh, in particular, during my stay there, we have been uh, looking at uh, isolated DC-DC converters and their uh, advanced control, also to mitigate those uh, stability issues and pulse power load uh, effects. And what we have shown is that, uh, that uh, predictive control can significantly outperform some conventional techniques, but that there is a bottleneck with computational burden. And uh, basically, we can do better than conventional control, which can be just an example of some experimental result, results. Uh, but, but of course, uh, there, is, there is a lot of room for improvement. And uh, as I will come back later, I believe that artificial intelligence is a technique that can uh, solve those, uh, those challenges. So if, if I should summarize what I have learned during uh, all my uh, moving around and uh, working on different projects is so uh, that, that I could identify some challenges in design, control, and diagnostics. So, of course, in design, we have uh, design of individual converter and also of the system. In control, battery is an issue. Uh, computationally efficient advanced controller, so something that works very well, but is able to be processed online by the microprocessor. This is a, this is a, a challenge. Uh, instilling intelligence and in, in, in adaptability in grid converters, and also developing resilient control techniques that are inherently uh, robust to, to uh, defects. So we, we could also call it fault-tolerant control in some way. And uh, considering uh, diagnostics, yeah, it's always about work, uh, uh, being able to detect faulty components, but more and more, uh, we are seeing that uh, it's important to be able to detect cyber attacks also <laughs> in a new, uh, new systems. And now I would like to go back and, and uh, show some results uh, from my recent research where, where I have solved some particular challenges using AI techniques. And uh, I would like to present three particular examples, again, one in uh, design, one in control, and one in uh, diagnostics. 
And basically, in all of these approaches, the basic principle is the same. We use uh, simulation models or uh, field data or experimental data um, um, or, or uh, f experiments or field to extract a lot of data. We use that data to train ar uh, artificial neural networks, which, which then serve as a digital twin for a certain application. So they map input and output relationship of any function. So, so basically, um, uh, it's very useful for the, for the relationship that are uh, difficult to explicitly model or for, uh, for relationships that are very computationally heavy to model. So we can have, for example, very complex controller that takes a lot of time to, to be executed online. But if we do it offline, we can take data from this controller and train this uh, artificial neural network, which is like a small brain, and it can uh, efficiently reproduce exactly what would com complex controller do, but it in a much shorter time frame, but at the same time with a high accuracy. So, so this fundamental idea I have applied uh, for, for these uh, three problems. And I would like to discuss uh, a little bit in more detail how exactly I have done it. Uh, so, so first case study was grid-connected uh, power converter interfacing photovoltaic panel. And the issue here was how do we design parameters of, of this power converter? So there are a number of parameters that, that is not straightforward uh, how we should choose them. For example, filter inductors, uh, uh, DC link uh, capacitance, DC link voltage, switching frequency, and so on. And what researchers have been doing at that time is that uh, they have built a reliability model of power converter and just run a lot of lengthy simulations with trial and error, trying to see, okay, if I change this parameter a little bit, what will be its influence on the overall lifetime? But this was very time-consuming and inefficient approach, uh, in my opinion. So I decided to apply this uh, idea of, uh, uh, of, of, of using these small ar uh, uh, artificial brains that can learn all those relationships and help us explicitly find uh, answers to, 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 to design. Uh, problems. And, and uh, so I constructed, uh, uh, the s I used the same simulation model as those researchers, but instead of simulating it by myself, I have put it uh, out, uh, to be simulated automatically by, by computer cluster. So by, uh, after a couple of hours of uh, systematic and automized simulations, it extracted a lot of data, how different parameters influence the thermal profile of the power converter, and in this way, since the thermal performance influences the lifetime, I was able to map explicitly the, the relationship of, of some uh, uh, design parameters to lifetime of the power converter. And instead of uh, getting this, so, so we, we, we get basically the same answers as detailed model, but in a much faster way. So what was possible to do then was to inverse also this model and say, okay, our, uh, sp uh, pre our desired lifetime is a certain number of years, and this uh, network can very quickly give us an answer what are the optimal parameters that will ensure we have those lifetime. So, so I believe that with this approach, together with uh, uh, my, my uh, mentors, Pat Wheeler and Frede Blaberg, I believe that we solved uh, one of the long-standing uh, research challenges in, in uh, reliability of uh, power converters. And uh, also then it can be used to create a Pareto fronts and uh, study the different relationships between uh, lifetime consumption and uh, different. So, so it's, it, it's very flexible after you, you build this kind of small artificial brain. Uh, then another, I think, interesting idea, which, which I developed with, with my PhD student from Olborg, Matea Novak, is, is to uh, create those similar structure, but for the real-time control. So basically, as I mentioned, model predictive control turned out to have much better performance than, than some traditional uh, linear controllers, but its issue is a very large computational burden. So if we, if we want to expand, for example, the prediction horizon, we end up with a controller that is not possible to, to be run online. So the idea was, what if we take, what, what if we expose those controllers to hundreds of thousands and millions of different operating conditions and see how this complex controller would react. So we can do it online, because we are, uh, if we do it offline, we are not burdened by the, 
uh, by the online computational burden. But then by extracting all this data, we were able to train the neural network that approximates as complex controllers as, as we like. And uh, this, this is a confusion matrix that simply shows that this neural network actually in around 98% uh, uh, of the time gives the same answer as the complex controller, but is ex uh, much less computationally expensive. So here we can see, uh, for example, uh, if we increase the horizon length, how the uh, number of calculation increases for, for conventional control and for neural network based control or digital twin. So we can see that uh, it, it's, it's, it's not affected by this because uh, it's, it's, a, it's small artificial brain built from the same number of neurons. It simply gets different data and, uh, and, and gives the same performance. So, so I think it was a very interesting result. And then another uh, interesting result was in application in cyber physical security uh, where, where we used uh, uh, we, we have been looking at small-scale uh, power converter-based system, uh, which, which uh, comprises a number of converters. And uh, uh, together with every little converter, we built little, uh, uh, this uh, neural network. And the idea was that uh, uh, we have a system that has certain inputs and produces certain outputs. But at the same time, this digital twin also takes those same inputs and produces some outputs. And if this digital twin is trained on the healthy model of the system, the assumption is that it will produce the same response for the same input. But if something goes wrong, of course, this digital twin will produce a little bit different answer. So this principal idea we have used uh, in order to be able to detect uh, cyber attacks in, in a small scale uh, power converter based system. So I also think it's, it's a, a, a fairly interesting uh, result. So maybe mentioning uh, some future research uh, directions. Of course, this, this powerful idea can be applied to, to many other uh, possible applications and uh, you know, possibilities are basically limitless. You know, it's, it's, uh, and, and it can really, in my opinion, solve many uh, research challenges. So I plan to pursue this idea in the coming years here as a, as a professor at uh, DTU. But I also plan to work on more classical power electronic research topics and uh, at the same time also we, uh, on some disruptive research topics. And in, the, in this uh, context, I have already established some uh, uh, collaboration inside DTU to develop some uh, uh, artificial creativity concepts uh, and, and, and so on. So it's, it's exciting time in front of us. And now uh, as, the, as the last part of my presentation, I would like to, to discuss what I have been doing for the past five months in my effort to, to establish myself uh, here at, uh, at DTU as a professor. So I'll talk a little bit about a uh, research group that I'm leading, uh, new uh, researchers that, that uh, we are onboarding, some uh, externally funded projects that we have received, and, and uh, uh, lab development process. So this is the group that, uh, that uh, I'm currently taking over. And uh, we have uh, um, uh, Professor Lenard Miatovic, who is, who is co-leader of the group, and uh, we have a number of students, a uh, number of postdocs, and these, these are the competences of the group that, uh, that are pretty much related to what I have been uh, talking about uh, uh, by now. And uh, about uh, new uh, PhD and postdoctoral projects, uh, so these are the new, new PhDs uh, from different funding instruments, uh, some, are, some are from uh, uh, internal EDTU, some are from uh, 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 Sino-Danish uh, Center, some are from the Chinese Scholarship Council, Chilean Scholarship Council, uh, Eurotech uh, uh, Alliance Scholarships and so on. So, and, and we are also in the process of uh, recruiting uh, other uh, uh, postdoctoral and PhD candidates. Uh, so uh, people who are uh, looking, please keep an eye open for open positions and, and kindly apply. Even though the competition is tough. Uh, and this is a new project uh, that, uh, that is actually starting uh, uh, next week. It should be a, a kickoff meeting. And it's EUDP funded, a uh, project called Action in collaboration with, uh, with Danfoss and, 
uh, be of and uh, the project uh, the, pro the idea of the project is that uh, actually a green transition is not only about uh, photovoltaics and wind and uh, EVs but actually project is based on the notion that more than 50 percent of uh, electricity consumption is consumed by various motors, pumps, compressors, uh, and, and so on. So uh, most of those motors are today connected to the grid through, through passive front-end uh, power converter interfaces, which do not have a capability of supporting the, uh, the power grid. So in collaboration with Amphos, we, in this project, we are developing a new generation of uh, uh, active front-end power converters, which uh, will will be able to uh, uh, yeah on, on one hand will be able to support the grid in decentralized way so we are uh, designing functions for grid support but on the other hand we are also looking how to uh, take advantage of communication platforms to provide those kinds of support from a large distributed population of active front end uh, converters and uh, we believe that uh, that uh, this idea can can significantly uh, um, uh, you know uh, support the, the larger penetration of uh, variable renewables then uh, we are also starting uh, uh, in uh, collaboration with power lab dk uh, um, uh, building of smart uh, power converter lab and uh, more than 10 grid connected power electronic uh, converters will will be built and uh, we expect to be able to do uh, first experimental tests uh, and results already in November 2020, but we anticipate inauguration uh, of the whole lab in spring uh, 2021. And now, my last slide, and the most important one, and maybe a little bit more, uh, more emotional uh, for me, so I apologize in advance if uh, my voice trembles a little bit uh, because of all the people uh, who have helped me to be here uh, where I am today. So, uh, starting from my mentor, Davor Škrlec, who has taught me good lessons um, in my career, and the most important one was that even a small step forward every day is better than nothing. And, uh, and it really helped me a lot at the beginning of my PhD when I didn't know what I was doing, so his support I, I, I really appreciated. Then uh, Hervoy Panjic, he was a PhD student at the same uh, time uh, as I was uh, in Croatia and the reason I mentioned him is that uh, because he was the first student who uh, took courage to take uh, a PhD study abroad at the top university and publish great research uh, results and, and he kind of showed me the way that it's possible to, to be a good researcher and based on this inspiration I contacted uh, Professor Guerrero, <coughs> who invited me to Olborg, and I had a good cooperation with him and uh, his group, and later I co collaborated a lot with uh, uh, Professor Frede Blaberg, who was also <coughs> a great leader, and I, I learned a lot uh, from him. Uh, then I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, Antonello Monti, who invited me for a guest uh, Professor stay at Aachen, and I will do that stay uh, next year. So I'm very much looking forward to uh, collaborating uh, with him. Then uh, my good friends from Nottingham University, Professor Pat Wheeler and Professor Tao Yang, uh, who have been uh, <coughs> great hosts uh, for me and uh, become my lifelong friends uh, in Nottingham. Uh, then uh, Professor Jose Rodriguez and uh, Marco Rivera, uh, who have been my hosts uh, during my stay in Chile. And uh, lastly, uh, from DTU, Professor Jacob Ostergaard, who has really uh, done a lot to, to, to make me feel welcome here at DTU and supported me in, in starting my group. And, and also Professor Nenad Miatovic, uh, who, who, is, uh, who is kind of uh, my closest collaborator here at DTU, and I really enjoy uh, his energy and uh, and positive attitude and how, how we can solve uh, things together. And also, lastly, big shout out to my uh, family, many students, colleagues, friends, very importantly, teammates from football and coaches. I learned a lot uh, from that also, and many others that uh, I apologize if, if I did mention, but consider themselves uh, valuable. Thank you very much.
thank you very much. It's really impressive. Um, and now we go to the next session. Uh, I can see that some has put in some questions, uh, and we have two different types of uh, platforms. And I know that our professor, Jacob Oestergaard, is prepared to take over and be in charge of that uh, session. So please go ahead, Jacob. Yeah, uh, thank you, Preben. Uh, uh, yeah, there's still a chance to post uh, questions in the chat uh, at YouTube and at, uh, at Zoom. Um, but uh, let, let me start with a, with a few here. Um, uh, you, 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 you show uh, this uh, future upcoming uh, activities with ah. active uh, front ends, yeah. and you say ah. that, that the new thing in, in this is uh, okay. that you can supply grid uh, uh, support. Yeah. Can, can you expand on that? What, what kind of uh, services can you provide from these uh, new type of uh, yeah. converters? Yeah, so, so there are basically two types uh, of services that we can provide. Uh, first is the hypothesis that uh, many of those motors have some flexibility in them. So there is some, uh, there is some, uh, they heat some water and you know, if, if we stop heating it, nothing will happen. So, so there is certain flexibility in those, like, uh, and this flexibility, uh, first challenge is how to estimate what is this, how much is that flexibility. And this is something that we are trying to develop in the project, to estimate how much each application has intrinsic flexibility. And then we have proposed some concepts like virtual battery and so on. But basically this flexibility gives us some active power reserve. So we can use that active power to, to provide, uh, for example, uh, congestion management, uh, also frequency support, which requires active power. Uh, at the same time, so this is one part related with active power. Another part is related with, uh, with reactive power support, which doesn't need active power, but active front end by itself is able to do it, uh, unlike uh, passive front end. So, so we are able to, to provide reactive power support, which can help us minimize the losses in the, in the power grid, but at the same time we can also provide harmonic uh, uh, compensation support. So if there are some uh, uh, harmonic pollution, we can provide, we can provide a kind of grid cleanup, as, as uh, our friends from Danfoss like to, uh, like to call it. So, so, so these, are the, these are the things we can do. And uh, we can do it in different ways. We can do it in decentralized way, where every power converter doesn't communicate with uh, any other converter, but just looks at, at grid information and uh, based on that, make some local decisions. But we can also build like, uh, like cloud-based computing system, which collects all the information from big population of those active front ends and make some central, uh, create some uh, uh, central computation or even distributed computation and send back, uh, sends back the references. And now with this cloud computing, this is also completely uh, feasible, but it's, it's a little bit more difficult to implement. But of course, potential is bigger. So, so these are the two types of, of things we can, uh, we can do. And it's important to notice that, uh, you know, the hypothesis is that those motors are all already out. So it's, it's, it's uh, not like we are building a very expensive and big battery to provide grid service. The only thing we need to do is to replace the passive front end with the, this new product that it is going to be developed by Danfoss. But I believe also other companies are looking at developing such, uh, such products. Yeah. And, and are you going to demonstrate some of these uh, ah. solutions? I can see the, the Bonholm and Nikian Fusion yeah. is part of ah. the project. Yeah, that's very good. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, DTU historically has good collaboration with Bornholm Island and uses it as a kind of living lab. So, so actually Bornholm Island is a partner in this project and uh, we are going to install uh, those active front ends in Bornholm and, and see in a real world how it works and, and what can we do with that. So, so I think, uh, yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, another question relates to, um, to uh, uh, your work on AI. Ah. And um, the question re relates to, to the applications. Uh, you showed a few uh, applications. For future? Uh, uh, no, for uh, existing, uh, what you have done al uh -huh. already. Uh -huh. um, and these are a kind of uh, 
uh, applications where where you where, where perhaps the reliability of of the outcome of the AI algorithm mm. is not mm. super critical. But what what if you start to use the AI uh, solutions in in more uh, safety critical applications like like the operational ah, aspect ah, of the power ah, system? Ah. Can you still rely on these type of technologies in in in? I, th I think I think uh, you are right that uh, for example these applications but i would say that for example this application with control is mission critical but but uh, interesting thing about this is that uh, uh, in one second we make oops, we make uh, thousands of decisions you know so even if one decision is wrong then next decision come next there is extremely low chance that we will make a wrong decision multiple times in a row. So, so it's like a, a much different application, for example, like image recognition. So it's, for example, very critical if car, self-driving car, recognizes something wrong, because it's an instant recognition and he makes a decision instantly. In this control, we make decisions all the time. So, so, so even if you make five uh, wrong decisions in a row, which is practically impossible, you know, it's, it's a bigger chance that you're going to fall from the airplane that, that, that then you're going to make five uh, wrong decisions in a row. But even if that happens, it will still work, you know. But, uh, but uh, to your, coming back to your question for these uh, more mission critical things, of course, this is an active area of research uh, where, where, where people are trying to dev devise uh, 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 tools to, to verify the, the, the performance of neural networks. And I think recently at CE, uh, our friend Spiros has won ERC grant that is actually looking at, 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 those, uh, at those problems. And I also have my own ideas how, how I would uh, look at that. And uh, uh, statistical model checking is, is, is one technique that I believe can, 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 can uh, provide a good answer to that, yeah. Okay. Then we have a question from Thomas Meyer Sørensen related to uh, DC uh, solutions. Uh -huh. uh, whether uh, DC grids, is that a thing uh, for the future with inverter-based nurture? How do you see that? Well, uh, well, I have done my PhD on DC grids and worked many years on, on DC grids and I have come to a conclusion that, that the grid will be AC but we will have many uh, many um, like uh, DC microgrids, and I think ma many people from power electronics community agree with me on this. It's simply too too expensive just to replace the whole infrastructure with DC, even though it has some benefits, efficiency-wise, reliability-wise. You know, for, for I believe that uh, every power uh, uh, power com uh, power electronic system inherently comprises a DC link. And then sometimes it's more efficient to combine more of them around the DC infrastructure. But to replace everything with DC, I think, I think it's unrealistic. So, uh. Okay, thank you. Um, then, then a bit more uh, yeah, or related to that uh, question, you talked about uh, stability uh, also in relation to both ah. uh, AC and DC. Mm. Uh, could, could you elaborate uh, uh, on that? Um, what are the, the different uh, difference in, in stability challenges in ah. that case? So, so basically DC systems are a little bit more simpler uh, to control and uh, uh, stability, you know, I, I like to look at stability through impedance-based approach. So, so we have uh, input side and the output side. And if, if there is certain impedance mismatch between these two sides, stability will be, instability problems will be created. And basically in the DC, uh, the, 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 the instability can be created by, for example, input filter resonance and a constant power load behavior. So it's very simple, it's just two two body plots, if they interact, or, or it, uh, another technique can be used. But in the, in the AC system, the, the situation is, is a little bit more complex because there are, there are more, the, the control system is, uh, is more complex and there are more components that can potentially uh, raise the, the stability issues. So, so we have uh, phase lock loops that introduce uh, uh, a, a kind of constant load behavior. We have constant load by themselves. We have three phase systems. We have 
unbalances and so on. So, so, but I think it's very interesting area of research, this uh, impedance-based stability in AC systems, and this is something that, that, that our group is going to look at, uh, possibly combining with AI uh, uh, for some new and, and better solutions. Okay, thank you. And uh, I sh should remind the audience uh, at uh, YouTube and Zoom that you can still post uh, questions. Um, another question is related to the, the uh, cyber-physical security challenges in, mm. in converter-based uh, power systems. What, what are, you, in your in, uh, opinion, the unresolved uh, challenges in, in that domain and uh, huh. are you going to address some of those in, in your future research? Uh, I think uh, I think that the biggest challenge with cyber physical there are many challenges in, in cyber security but but what I am looking at uh, together with my, my collaborators is cyber physical security and this is assuming that uh, primarily uh, primarily defense mechanisms have failed so so firewalls have been broken somebody has stolen a password and so on, and already there is cyber attack going on uh, in the system. So, so what I'm trying to do is to detect those uh, cyber attack. But the big challenge in this is, even if you design some technique that can uh, that can uh, detect certain type of cyber attack, you are never sure what kinds of cyber attacks can happen. You know, it can happen in in uh, infinite number of ways. So, so. I think this is the biggest research challenge because th there is no way to, to say, okay, this technique is 80% reliable because you don't know. Because uh, cyber attacks depends on creativity and intelligence of cyber attacker. And actually, I have initiated uh, collaboration uh, with, with uh, other colleagues in DTU where we are trying to model this kind of creative process you know, how, how cyber attacker, when, when he sees the system, what, what is he, you know, what, what is he doing now, you know? How he learns about the system, or she? And, and how, how, how to automatically craft rich diversity of cyber attacks, and then use it to validate, to validate actually how our defense strategy works well. And I think this is an ongoing challenge that, uh, that, that I'm really, you know, eager to, to try to solve also with, with new PhD students and so on. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. You. Uh, let me just check if there's um, other questions. Okay, then, then I have another one. Ah. Um, uh, when you, you mentioned uh, design and, and control in relation to, uh, mm. to energy storage. Uh, are, are they related or it's uh, separate uh -huh. uh, uh, challenges? Uh, I, I think it's a very interesting problem with, with, uh, with storage is because when, when we put energy storage in certain application, we need to control it in, in a certain way. But to control it, you know, to decide how we will control it, we need to know what is its capacity, you know. So, so but basically to to put to decide what is going to be capacity we also need to know how we will later control it you know so it's a kind of chicken and egg problem you, you never know where to start where, where to stop you know and at the same time storage needs to perform a certain function also you know it's it's like if we put it on the ship it needs to compensate for peak loads if we put it in the EV charging station it needs to compensate for the charging so we have three Three, uh, three dogs that are chasing its own tail, you know, and, and basically what people do, they just say, okay, this is the size, then we're going to control it in this way. So, but, but uh, of course, this is not an optimal way to, to approach this problem, and I think that uh, AI can also help us address those issues. And actually, we are, we are pr working on some projects uh, on, on, on that. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. Oh, thank you. Then, then there's uh, a question from our dean, Philip uh, Binning, and I will read it. It's, it's, there's okay. some introduction, so I just read it loud as it is. Uh, did you wish us to support a transformation to a new energy infrastructure that is much more sustainable? Your research will be very important in that, for, in, for example, in load management and smoothing out uh, big variations in power sources. We don't 
talk very much about infrastructure in this uh, conversation. It is all about electric cars, etc. Where do we need to do? Uh, uh, where do we need to do? What what do we need to do to upgrade our infrastructure? Well, uh, infrastructure will, uh, you know, of course, uh, we don't know how much you can do with 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 these flexible loads. I th I think active front ends with motors, it's it's kind of new because because these demand response ideas have been uh, tried on on more slow thermostatically controlled loads, and it has been tested in the field, but. Uh, you know, hypothesis is that in these controllable motors there is a huge potential, but we simply don't know how much it is. You know, we need to we need to start estimating what is the flexibility there, and uh, and of course uh, uh, a huge saving in infrastructural investments can be done if this if indeed there is a, a big potential there. Uh, but but uh, uh, considering investments, you know, uh, there will be huge investments in electrical vehicle charging infrastructure, for example, uh, and those, uh, uh, especially these uh, fast chargers, you know, th there are not so many places that uh, where, where you can install s a, a lot of a lot of those chargers, and uh, it will take a lot of infrastructural investments to support this uh, charging infrastructure. I think I read somewhere that uh, by 2040. Uh, nobody in Denmark will 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 buy uh, gasoline car. Everybody will buy electrical vehicles. So so this will be one of the huge investments. Maybe also in uh, investments in uh, high voltage DC uh, stations, which are very flexible in evacuating power. Yeah. So so this would be my answers probably. Uh. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, perhaps, if I may al allow a personal uh, sure. question, yeah. also uh, actually related uh, to this, and and um, it's actually at, at the department and in the the center we have actually quite a number of people working on more on the grid uh, infrastructure uh -huh. uh, side uh, uh -huh. of 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 the cha challenge of of the green transformation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, to, to where do you see the the coupling between what you're doing and and what they are they are doing in on the on the grid? Uh, are there, or are, is it two separate problems, or or, mm. or do you have mm. some mm. some links with the, but, but I, yeah. and the grids and, and etc.? I, I feel that uh, that uh, other groups at, at CE and department are are looking more. Uh, into system level, kind of, you know, like like considering very large number of uh, of components, how how they will interact. But what Nena and me are doing in, in our group, we focus more on power converter itself, you know. So 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 I, I see collaboration in in the way that uh, people who study very large population of because everything will be power electronics uh, in future, you know. So it's just the point uh, from which angle do we look at the problem. So, so other groups look at the problem from system side and see power converters as black, black boxes that can provide certain function. And then, other than me, uh, we look how we are going to realize that function in the most uh, optimal way possible. So this is where I see uh, collaboration. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. But I, I can I can perhaps compliment and say I really uh. see the same. Uh, uh. Complementary uh, uh, uh. approach, and I think there's a lot of synergy in bringing these two together and find the right right future solutions. So uh. I think there's a lot of opportunities uh. there. Uh, then, if we should keep the time, I guess that's something like the last question. Uh, we have one more from uh, Aris, uh, and I also I'll just read it here. Uh. I think uh, that in your presentation, I've seen the term grid forming only once mentioned. Uh -huh. Do you think that grid forming control is not the way forward for grid connected converters in the modern power system? Well, th that's a good question. Actually, I, uh, I published recently a review article where, where I addressed this. Uh, this issue where, 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 where actually there is uh, a discrepancy in the literature about the name grid forming converter, you know. So what, what historically has been considered grid forming converter is a converter that can build its own grid. But what, uh, what, what I consider, uh, what now, you know, the, the, the notions have been changed a little bit and now the gr uh, grid forming converter is actually grid supporting converter. So it's a converter that is connected to the grid but supports the grid in a certain way. 
And I think I have been talking all the time about grid supporting converters, so, so this is the answer. Actually, it's, it's a discrepancy in terminology, you know. I think people like to call it grid forming uh, converter, but, but actually, yeah, I think it's very important topic uh, to, to, to say it, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, and also uh, the Ortens from uh, Zoom, which has been connected here. I think it's really um, like a dialogue, the last part here, so it's not only one way. So thank you very much, uh, Thomas Long. So now we need a big, big applause. I can say that in this room here we are six in total. <laughs> That's not that many. So please uh, help me and the group here and the, the auditorium to give a big applause. And uh, maybe, as you can see, we will hand over some flowers, and you need that as well, of course. Uh, so this was the formal part, but please keep on. Uh, so I hope you also uh, hang on a little bit more, because I know that at least uh, one or two would like to say something. And um, I don't know if it's either... Ninette, would yes. you like... you? I think the best way to do it is actually come up here, <laughs> because then it's easier for those uh, on distance. So please, the floor is yours. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Brevin. Um, thank you very, very much for this opportunity. I would like to actually uh, say thank you to Tomislav for a, for a, for a really uh, a riveting presentation and, 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 and on, a, on a very uh, uh, relevant technical subject. Uh, I think that you have you have opened a sort of uh, I, I don't want to call it a Pandora's box, but there is uh, endless possibilities about like wh what what can be done and, and what is uh, sort of the potential. And you have also I think you have a very um, non-conventional view about the power engineering as well. Like you, you approach power engineering from from very creative perspective, like artificial intelligence, uh, uh, behavioral science. You just also mentioned it's it's a very sort of uh, I think refreshing to 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 a field. So, so I think that that's a, that's a really, really uh, uh, inspiring thing. I think that somebody at least who, 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 who thinks or who likes to believe that understands the field, I think that I, I can definitely vouch for the, for the, for the endless uh, or for the amount of sort of potential that this, this field I holds. I think a good match. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, so in the future, future holds. And I, I definitely see you as an extremely valuable uh, contribution to, uh, to, uh, to, to our group. Uh, I, I also have a sort of a, a, a slight selfish sort of a, a reason why, why, I, why I would like to sort of welcome Tomislav and that's a basically that we are speaking the same language so we can, <laughs> we can all, always uh, uh, sort of chat very easily about the technical things and in sport related things and we also well. live close to each other. And we also so live close to each other as well, exactly, exactly. So, so I would like to say on behalf of at least a group uh, uh, that did uh, the warmest welcome uh, uh, to DTU and I. We, we hope for uh, for a very long and, and fruitful collaboration. Thank you very much. Yeah. So that's that's me. Thank you very much. I also know that uh, Jacob would like to uh, to have the words. So please, Jacob, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Just uh, very, very briefly to supplement what uh, Nina had already uh, expressed. Um, I, I promised on the behalf of the, the leader group to also uh, 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 say a few words. And uh, I know they will all have liked to be present here today, but we'll manage in, in, in this way. And, and I think we also uh, man managed to, to do it uh, 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 properly. Um, most of us uh, has just got to know you very, very recently, uh, during the last half or one year. And uh, it has been really a, a, a positive experience. You have an extraordinary drive. You have very high ambitions. And you also have a lot of uh, innovative uh, ideas, and I think you you put a lot of on uh, you put a lot of uh, high standards to yourself and your work, and strive uh, towards uh, excellence. 
and uh, it has been uh, really an experience to experience your, your personal drive and the eagerness to get uh, started and, and so on. And I think you have uh, actually managed to, in very short time, to do a lot. Uh, attract the funding, hire people, uh, uh, interact with colleagues, uh, contribute to uh, the, the uh, different management uh, activities and so on. So that's, that's really uh, impressive and uh, uh, I think we all look, look forward to the, to the future uh, collaboration. Um, and we also uh, uh, found a few things. I, I think you should you should open it uh, after the okay. the uh, session here. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, welcome to thank you uh, very much. to you and thank you very much. department. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jacob. I would also like to just uh, add a little bit. Uh, because uh, when I first was introduced to you by uh, Jacob Östergaard, he mentioned that we would like to have a flying start. Mm. And I think you had a flying start here at the department. But sometimes when you have a flying start, it's also sometimes a little bit, uh, it can go too fast sometimes, because you have, as mentioned by uh, Jacob, a lot of drive, and you would like to perform, and you would like to uh, get progress and so on. So I, he, I hope that uh, you started with a flying start and you have all that uh, motivation for in order to do something that you will keep on that. That might sometimes, uh, that some others, we need to help you a little bit more in order to uh, go on with that kind of flying start. So I'm really looking forward to uh, the cooperation together with Jacob and the rest of the group and so on and also the home department and also uh, all your colleagues at the DTU because it's also important to be in cooperations with uh, colleagues at DTU and also uh, international. And in that respect, I think it's really, um, I like that very much that you also mentioned all those you have been in contact with during your road here to DTU. You mentioned those from uh, other international colleagues and so on because I think it's very important for you that you keep on with that, uh, being in contact and also uh, that kind of cooperation with a colleague uh, international. So uh, I look really forward to it. So congratulations. Thank you very much, yeah. brother. So that is it. Thank you very much.